this is Voice of the Iceberg. I'm Alison Balance, and this is Adventure, part three of a four-part audio series from RNZ in which we join artist Joseph Michael and his team on an expedition to the Antarctic Peninsula. They're recording photos, film, and audio of icebergs that will be projected onto landmark buildings around the world, creating virtual bergs. In parts one and two, we journeyed to Antarctica and discovered the varied voices of icebergs. We met artist Joseph Michael, behind the scenes director Ryan McNeil, safety guide Nick Fluvier, sound recordist Mark Michelle, AKA Mitch, assistant photographer Thomas Haletta and scientist Mike Williams. Now the adventure continues, both at sea and on land, in search of the blue heart of the bergs. Tove was a really beautiful um, iceberg, actually. It was um, one of the calmer days. So depending on the nature of the ocean and, um, and the ocean state would affect the sound of the iceberg as well and how the iceberg was interacting with that ocean state. And it had this, uh, it was like a lagoon. So it was quite eerie. Once I uh, made my way on the tender inside the lagoon, it was really pleasing. It was almost like I was in some tropical island. There's this beautiful light white blues. And um, I was getting some great recordings. And I realized that I was sitting above um, a shelf. Um, so it had the iceberg. Obviously, there's a heck of a lot that happens underneath what we see. And there's a shelf um, that was underpinning this iceberg. So I got a couple of contact mics and attached them to some metal stakes that I had there as part of my kit as a, as a bit of a uh, experiment. And I lowered it um, onto the shelf itself. So uh, about 20 meters down, it just sat there and it started picking up all these beautiful booms, these low end pulses, um, almost like a, that low frequency of a whale song that we're all um, quite familiar with, I suppose. And it um, was, yeah, really quite gentle, um, low frequency uh, pulse and hum that just ebbed and flowed um, along very much in line with what I was seeing above. It feels like you're in a strange otherworldly place because as a New Zealander you're used to seeing one glacier or maybe two valleys of glacier and then you'll see the green but seeing the white and the endless white and the endless water surrounding you was quite surreal. You know, the continent's twice the size of Australia and, and the whole thing is just covered in ice. Antarctica is made up of two Antarctic ice sheets. So we have the, the West Antarctic ice sheet and the East Antarctic ice sheet. So the West Antarctic ice sheet sort of sits um, centred around the Antarctic Peninsula and coming round towards the Ross Sea. Probably the easiest way to think about how much ice there is in Antarctica is if it all melted, we would get around 50 metres of sea level rise around the whole globe. It's where 90% of the fresh water in the world is, is locked in the Antarctic ice sheet. If we think of this just a snowflake falling out of the sky, that piece of snow is, is going to land, land on, the, on the surface of Antarctica and there it'll, it'll obviously join with a whole bunch of other snowflakes. And they begin a journey together where they become buried over time and as they're buried, the snow is pressed and, and compressed and the air comes out of the snow and it's turned into ice. Then as ice it's going to flow down off the top of Antarctica from around 3,000 metres above sea level and it's going to flow down the glaciers, through the mountains and into the ice shelves that are around Antarctica.
The ice that's in an iceberg, by the time it's got to the front of an ice shelf and carved off, can easily be tens of thousands of years old. It can be a long journey to, from being a snowflake that's fallen at the South Pole, then has flowed off the ice sheet and into the ocean. But there are other parts, for example, around the Antarctic Peninsula, where probably the time scale is only in the thousands to hundreds of years, just because there the, the glaciers are a little bit faster and so the snowflake's journey into an iceberg is, is much shorter. It's a massive uh, element of, of what makes Antarctica, being Antarctica to me, the textures and um, all the different sort of ice components or I don't know how you can say that's it's really it's really you've got the snow you've got the iceberg over the water the iceberg under the water and then you've got different um, different sets or different sort of um, transparency like you would get really transparent ones and opaque and the, the way the light strikes in, inside them it's amazing how blue they are actually hey against the sky do you get a powdery blue but you also get a blue that's it's like there's a layer of ice in front of it and then the uh, the ice compacts together and so you get this blue that's it's almost iridescent or it's almost like it's backlit because there's a there's a there's a layer of ice in, in front and then you you get a really beautiful light colored blue in behind um, it's interesting because you can never p pinpoint exactly which color it is there's, there's always a a variety of colours there. I wanted to get down inside some crevasses to sort of really see what it was like inside an iceberg. Getting onto some of the icebergs is okay but you're just adding to the danger level if you're going to try and get down inside crevasses on the icebergs. Because the icebergs break off from the glacier I you know, ask Nick if it was possible to, to get down inside some of them and, and just get some different colours. Um, I wanted to photograph those, the blues that you get inside the glaciers, have a sense of what it feels like to be inside an iceberg. I was so excited <laughs> to be on land. That was one of the most special experiences of my life, was just actually being on land, I guess, for, for a couple of reasons, because we'd, it was the first time in about 11 days or something. Um, and as much as I love a boat, I wouldn't say I was a, a seafarer. I had the audio gear with me and um, I was picking up all the sounds of, of our boots and the schist and granite and the skewers who were overhead. Just, you know, distant avalanches. The noise of carabiners and rope. And Nick explaining things meticulously to ensure our safety. Yeah, so the idea is that if you were to ram the shaft of your ice axe in the snow and sit on it, this becomes an anchor. Yeah. And he was determined to get Joe down to see some blue ice. My role was safety. I'd done a lot of climbing in New Zealand and a lot of um, guides training, and uh, which was a pathway I didn't pursue. And I was probably yeah, quite daunted by the scale of the landscape I knew I was going to. And uh, there are a lot of unknowns around glacial travel on those enormous glaciers for me. Glaciers are actually quite fluid. They're a bit like a slow river. They are oozing down valleys and uh, where a glacier rolls over a prominence in the landscape and where it becomes steeper, you get tension. And uh, in, in these areas of tension, the glacier or the ice cracks open. And that's where we can start seeing deep down inside into the blue, the guts of the glacier. In the mountains, um, Nick said this a couple of times, is that you tend to avoid the crevasses as quickly as possible so you can get up the you know, and do the real job, which is climbing the mountain. But in Antarctica, we were kind of we were doing the opposite, and we were heading straight for the crevasses. So there's a level of anxiety and trust that you have in your guide. And, and three of us would be roped together um, for safety. We had three of us at one time travelling um, on a rope, and um, and the idea is that if one person falls in then there's two people left 
to build an anchor and haul that person out. So you're really relying on that safety and numbers uh, approach for glacier travel and the rope being the umbilical. So a bit of training involved with the guys. Um, we went through some basic glacial travel on our trial run and then on, on the day we went for a good hike. So once we got on, on land, we would be separated by about 20, I think it was about 20 metres each. And so that's the first feeling you get as, as, as isolation because when you're walking in, say, a foreign place with a friend, you normally walk quite close to them. And so having that separation from the next person is, that, is the first sensation of isolation. And then you've got to trust that Nick is going to navigate you in a safe place because we kind of, obviously the closer you get to the crevasses, it's a very dangerous area. You get these, they're called bridges, which is an area of snow that looks like a flat surface, but it's, it's a very thin layer and there's actually a huge crevasse underneath. You get better at picking routes through glaciers after you know years of doing that sort of thing, but um, it, so there's always a sense of uneasiness. Uh, there's an unknown whether or not there's a, a thin bridge of snow above uh, a deep blue cavern <laughs> below you. Uh, most of the time you're walking on ice, but at times you're certainly walking across bridged crevasses which you can't see. This is a territory I would never even imagine I would go near. Yeah, we'll keep, keep going. Anyhow, we're walking on land and I'm feeling like one of the original explorers of the place. I'm on a long line with all my gear and an ice axe and different things and just absolutely feeling that moment of being an original explorer. Um, and just following Nick and listening. It requires a certain level of uh, concentration. Yeah. And then these these damn snowshoes, they're, they're amazing to have, but it, one foot just went sort of halfway through and up to my knees. And then I thought, oh, okay, and it was stuck. And I couldn't, I, I, and you can imagine the other foot's up, um, probably okay. half, at least half a metre, over half a metre <laughs> distance up above it. So really trying to get the angle to to pull myself out of that was impossible. No, I actually can't get my foot. Use your axe or something to dig it out. Right. Oh, no. And of course my audio's still rolling and um, I was, and Nick's like, okay, just use your ice axe, mate. It's gonna be okay. Just dig your dig your leg out. So I, I sort of turn around the most awkward angle, digging my right leg out, digging, 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 and then my left leg falls through to the same position. So. Well, that's okay. It's fine. Not for one moment thinking that there's a hole below me. Just thinking, oh, it's a bit deep snow. We'll be fine. I'll get myself out. Digging away. After a short time, my right foot just falls right through, and I fall up to my um, my, my arms. Thankfully, for some reason, my I sort of put my wings out, so to speak, and I'm literally up to my armpits, and I'm holding myself by my arm. And I look down between my legs, and there's just eternal blue. So I was actually the first person to see the blue ice when we were on land. Mate, what am I up to? Mate, and of course, your rope is a fair distance in between you for safety reasons. And he said, what have you got in your hands? And I, I sort of, I said, right. this, this thing, referring to the handy recorder, my my sidekick, and he said, well, start away, throw it, do what you got to do. And I thought, I'm not throwing it. <laughs> but that's where the audio cuts out. I was beside myself, and so he's busy talking me through. He says, use your other hand with the ice axe and dig yourself, pull yourself up. So I can't see, I'm at ice level, I'm at the ground level, and they can see that I'm actually crawling along the, the line of the crevasse. So I put my arm out to pull myself up, and my arm falls through. So the hole just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and my heart is absolutely racing. Anyhow, you know, I managed to pull myself up. Yeah, the experience of that, I guess, was was amazing because I did feel completely safe with Nick because he he knows what he's doing, and that's why we had him there. And 
I, you know, it's nice to be able to say I, I fell in a hole, I guess, but I know how those things can end, and I certainly wasn't taking it um, lightly. But, you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty treacherous um, terrain to be in. Feeling helpless with nothing below your legs and using your upper body strength, which I'm not known for, um, to get yourself out of a sticky situation is just um, something I'll absolutely remember forever. That was great fun that day. I think it was good for all of us. For me, it, uh, I made peace with the enormous glacier that we were on and realised that it really, yeah, apart from the, the scale of it, it's, it's uh, behaving a lot like our glaciers here in New Zealand. For the guys, I know it was their first time snowshoeing, first time on uh, glacial travel with ropes. And uh, Ryan's uh, moment, he clearly could see down between his legs into the, the abyss and, and the whites of his eyes were very bright. But, uh, you know, it was uh, very controlled and um, we quickly had him uh, back on his feet and, off and walking again. It was actually an accident that we found the crevasse which Joe ended up photographing, the perfect blue ice crevasse. Putting in a soft snow anchor I'm feeling pretty good about where we are right now. We're it's really hard to see what a crevasse is going to be like from the from the top. When we found the 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 one that I got my favourite photograph from, I could instantly tell how uh, I guess the adrenaline levels were going to be by the smile on Nick's face because he had a he was he was almost laughing with excitement about how glorious this one was and. Um, was this big, it was probably, I don't know if it was 40 or 50 metres deep, and it had hard, hard sides, so it was really great for photographing it was that blue ice that I wanted. Quite, there's quite a bit of preparation around that. Uh, I had to, of course, prepare, prepare the area above where he was going um, so that nothing would fall down, so we did a bit of cleaning, um, knocking off some bits of ice and uh, clearing snow from the edge so it was safe for him to go in. Um, I spent quite a bit of time looking down into it, just trying to get a sense of well, how I felt about it, how stable everything was, and, uh, and in the end uh, we set up a system where I could lower him down and then haul him back out pretty easily, uh, and uh, yeah, we sent him over the edge. <laughs> You're going to love it, I'm excited, so excited to get you down there. I've done abseiling before, but I hadn't abseiled inside a crevasse. Holy! <laughs> yes. At the no, time, Joe was uh, certainly oh, uh, his yeah. heart was pounding. I could see that he was excited, a little apprehensive, um, and uncomfortable. <laughs> right. the initial moment of tension. It's always scariest when you. When it's like skydiving or bungee jumping, it's that first moment where you uh, get me in there. Okay. Get me release in. yourself and you put all of your trust into your guide. Oh my god. Well, it's much better now than inside. It didn't take long once he, he got down there and into that blue uh, cavern that we lowered him into that he forgot everything and was swept away by where he was and what he was photographing. And I'm on the lucky side. It didn't take long for him to start giggling and for us to see a smile on his face down there. Just hold it there. Once you're down and then you start photographing, it's fine, but it's that initial moment that's uneasy. But, you know, it's exciting. Once I was down inside the big one, I, I took a series of photographs. And then I just I sat inside, I put the camera down and put the sound recording equipment down and sat and enjoyed it for, for a few minutes. Okay, Joe, I'm going to haul you now. Oh, there you go. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Good.
Because sitting here looking the way I'm looking, it looks like oh, I'm in sort of New Zealand, I'm up some bluffs looking at a glacier, and then you look over my right shoulder and you kind of go, Holy that's God. right, we're in Antarctica, <laughs> there's icebergs. <laughs> it's quite surreal standing here. That's amazing. And looking out, and literally from this position, we can see what, 500 icebergs? Yeah. 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 And the rest. <laughs> Amazing granite walls here. It's steep, isn't it? Yeah. It's steep. We were sitting up here before and we heard a thunderous crack that came up the valley. Oh, hell, what the hell is that? And you look down and there's just this tiny iceberg bobbling down and a tiny little fraction of it. It's just blew off and you saw the pools go out. It's just a tiny it's iceberg small. in the middle and it radiated through the hole yeah. right up to us. These are Gen 2 penguins and they're very funny penguins. So what you're hearing now is the parents, but you're also hearing the chicks. The chicks who are very hungry and they want to be fed by their parents. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of them here. And it's an amazing sight and it's amazing to hear this. Pretty easy to get distracted around here, isn't it? Back to the berg. Back to the berg. We also saw many humpback whales um, every day. Not a day went by where we didn't spend some time with whales gliding along on their side, looking up out of the water to us. <laughs> there was definitely a connection. I think for me, unexpectedly, the deepest sense of connection with the place and, and the memory I'll take away most is those moments with whales and dolphins and the wildlife. That was Adventure, part three of Voice of the Iceberg. You heard from Joseph Michael, Ryan McNeil, Mark Michelle, aka Mitch, Nick Fluvier, Thomas Haletta, scientist Mike Williams, and Penguin Guide and Australis crew member Florence Cooper. The Voice of the Iceberg podcast series was produced and edited for RNZ by me, Alison Balance with field audio from Ryan McNeil and Mark Michelle, and sound engineering by Mark Chesterman. Music by Rian Sheehan was composed for Antarctica, While You Were Sleeping, an exhibition projecting a digital iceberg onto the exterior of the Auckland War Memorial Museum as part of the 2017 Auckland Arts Festival. Want to listen again? Catch up on an earlier episode or see photos of the icebergs? head to rnz.co.nz slash iceberg. We're also on iTunes and Spotify, and please do rate us if you like what you've heard. It helps. Now, if you want to stick around for another 30 seconds, here's a hint of what you'll hear in part four when we meet an iceberg named Lincoln. Lincoln.